Yeah. Here's, here's the example, exact example I wanted to. This is to make it 50% transparent. And you can do some fairly effective things with this. You know, if you want, for example, your, um, one thing we talked about with background images is with a background image, um, sometimes um, if you have text on top of a background image, the text can be very difficult to read. All right? Well, one thing that you can do is you could obviously make the paragraph then, or whatever the text's in, a color, a certain color. All right? The problem then is that it blocks out the picture, all right? and you can't see the picture underneath. So one thing that you can do is you can put some opacity, which means that you can make, you can put a white background to something, but make it semi-transparent. And this is a code to do that. Now, if you notice, and, and they have this example in the book uh, somewhere, I can't recall the exact page. But what this does is, this is sort of the standard way you should be able to set opacity. But we all know that Internet Explorer doesn't always act in a standard manner. Therefore, we have this snippet of code in here to handle it for Internet Explorer. So there's a lot of cases, especially in CSS, where you'll have something addressed a couple of different ways. All right? In other words, we have for everyone else and for Internet Explorer. Let me show you an example of this that actually is from one of my other classes. I hope the example is still on this machine. I believe it would be. Here we want text over top of an image, yet if we put the text on top of the image, we'd have a hard time reading it. Even if we change to make the text white, we'd have a hard time to reading it because there's a big contrast between the images. In other words, the image is dark over this section, so if we made the text white, once we got over here, it would still be hard to read. So what we do instead is I put a, a white background on it, but I made it semi-transparent. So the aim is that it gets the best of the both worlds. It's a little hard to see this, but you can see sort of the image peeking out from underneath it. So you still get a sense of the image, but you can still read the text. And in this case, I use CSS very similar to the example that um, I showed there. Let's take a look at it. where I have two different ways of setting the opacity. You know, that looks redundant, but the reason for that is that it's accommodating different browsers. Yes? It doesn't require a lot of, um, the same thing with branching off of two different versions. One of which is opacity, which I get the concept of. Right. The second one is dealing with Internet Explorer. Yes.
Y yeah, you're right. The question was, didn't we deal with the fact that Internet Explorer is different by putting uh, a snippet of code at the top of the page? And the answer is we partially dealt with it. IE has a, uh, has a whole slew of differences. Uh, for one thing, and, and again, for one thing, that seems to be characteristic, you know, and not putting a value judgment of it, but Microsoft seems to do things in a way that's non-standard from a lot of the other community, uh, the, a lot of the other web development community. But even in terms of like how, uh, you know, the code base and all that, Mozilla, Chrome, all of those are built sort of off the same base. So, yeah, they're going to act the same, Chrome and Firefox and Safari and all those things. But Internet Explorer sort of marches to its own drum and therefore is apt to behave differently. All right, which is again the important for doing that. Now, the question that you asked about the HTML shiv, which we looked at and we put a snippet of code in here um, in our page, that dealt with one specific issue. All right, let's, here we go. We put this code, or something that looked very much like this code, we put on the top of every page. All right. Where we downloaded uh, a, a little JavaScript snippet called the HTML5 shiv, and we put that on there. And, and the statement was that, uh, that that addresses incompatibilities with, with Internet Explorer. The complete statement is, is this addresses a lot of the incompatibilities caused by HTML5 in Internet Explorer. So this doesn't solve all of your HTML, or I'm sorry, all of your Internet Explorer compatibility issues. This addresses the issues brought on by HTML5, specifically the issues brought on by some of the new HTML5 elements like article, header, aside, section. And those. So th this this only this only solves some of the problem. Is the bottom line. So I don't I don't go too deep in this discussion, but I'll, I'll ask this question. No, this is a great time for this discussion. Okay. So we, we, yeah, second, we can. I guess my second question is: so we've, it feels to me like if we intuitively, it feels to me like if we sort of hack Internet Explorer with this code, the latest version of HTML, mm -hmm. that previous version should have been caught up in. No, it's really, it's really none of the above. The, quest, the question relates to why doesn't this snippet of code take care of everything, all right? And the answer is that, um, the short answer is it doesn't, and we, we'd still have to deal with other issues, for example, one of them being the opacity. The long answer is there's things that we can correct via our code, and there's things that we cannot correct via our code, all right? The things that we can correct via our code specifically and the major issues, for example, that Internet Explorer previous versions don't recognize um, the HTML5 tags like article and all that. That's something that is straightforward. It's going to cause everyone a problem in the world that's doing HTML5 development. All right, And it's something we can correct via code. So there's a fix for it. We put that there, boom. The rest of it is there. Some of the other things, like the opacity issue, you simply can't correct that via code. All right? If you could, it would be very convoluted, and it really wouldn't be an issue for everyone, right? You don't use opacity, it's not a problem for you. All right? And in fact, if I didn't address Internet Explorer, it would simply show a solid white block. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe I don't care the fact that it's not, you know, that, that, I, can, that I can see through it. So the bottom line is some things we can fix through our code, some things we can't, or at least can't easily. I always hesitate to use the word can't because can't, you know, um, is an iffy word. So would you say there are five opacity type problems or there are 500 opacity type problems? Or, or is it just, you know, you write something out there and it looks good in Chrome and it looks good in all the 
out, okay, here they all are. There are 17 things that don't translate. I, 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 think, I think what we can say is we could identify areas where we're likely to have issue but all the specific issues we could have in those areas would probably be a lot. Keep in mind that, you know, issues arise not necessarily because of specific things, but because of things in specific combinations and, and all that sort of thing. Okay. The bottom line for this is, is that just testing is required. You know, um, you know, a, a theoretical discussion and, and knowing all the things that could go wrong doesn't benefit you as much as taking the time and testing it. You know, running it on different versions of the browser and seeing how it works. And, and then going in and addressing them. Over time, you'll notice the things that typically go wrong. Like, IE, prior to IE9 doesn't have great um, CSS3 support. So you know that. Now, that's one of probably the big gotchas. You know, you said, oh, there are five of these kinds of problems or whatever. CSS3 uh, support would be one of the big gotchas. Now, under that, though, there might be a million little gotchas, all right, if that makes sense. Um, but really getting in and testing it and testing early in the process as opposed to waiting until you're all complete, all right, and then repetitively testing is, is something that you need to do. All right. Um, this is probably, in my mind, anyhow, this is the, the most frustrating aspect of web development because you can do everything by the book. All right. Now, to be sure, um, there can be issues where your code is wrong. In other words, you don't follow the HTML or CSS specification. You make a mistake. And one of the browsers is nice enough to forgive you of that mistake and it's able to take what you've said and figure out what it's supposed to do. All right? Whereas another browser won't. All right? In that, the, in that case, you know, you may curse the browser that doesn't do it right, but really the fault is your own. All right? You know, um, you're lucky that the other one forgave you. It's not bad luck that the other one didn't. All right? But the worst part of it is you can still follow the rules correctly and still have an issue with your code. And, and that is probably the frustrating part. How do you know if you follow the rules correctly? How do you know that, that you haven't made a mistake in your tags? And that isn't what the problem is. Yeah, well, one way, one way, one potential way is that it just doesn't show up right. Right, that would be one thing. So, so I will tell you recently that's been a frustration because coming from color programming language where you've got an IDE that can do a little squiggly line and won't compile. Great. <laughs> right. There's my problem. Right, right. So I, um, I, 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 I look forward to the answer. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually it's fortunate that web browsers don't blow up the way that other programming languages do. All right. Because if, for example, let's say I had a, uh, I put in a new tag, uh, an HTML5 tag that my browser doesn't know about because I'm running an old browser, all right? It will display what it can without blowing up. And that's actually a good thing. For example, let's consider the opacity. Let's say that I set the opacity, I don't put the IE code in there, and I just have the code that works on, on Mozilla, on Firefox, and Chrome, and all them. All right? If I don't put that code in there, and I try to open the page in Internet Explorer, if it worked like an old school programming language, it would blow up and you'd see nothing. Here, what's going to happen? Well, the display just won't be transparent. All right. Not a huge deal. At least the person still gets their information, and it might not look quite as pretty as you'd want it to, but at least the page still loads. That's actually called uh, degrading gracefully, all right, is, is a term for it, where you have a page that when you open it in an older browser that, that 
isn't as current as your code is, that it may not look pretty. In other words, you lose some of the functionality or you lose some of the appearance. In other words, that appearance degrades. It, it goes down a level. But at least it does it in a manner where you can still see it. You can still get the information on the page. So it's actually good that pro, uh, uh, web pages act that way. Good for the user, that is, and good for the, the, the web world as a whole. It's not good for developers because developers then, if there's a problem, they, they, they don't get the little squiggly line that you would in Visual Studio or whatever. At least, at least the way that we're doing it. We're doing it, we're developing web pages a very Spartan way, right, using a plain old text editor. Why? Because I want you to really learn this stuff. I don't want you to depend on using an IDE. Uh, one experience I have uh, with students where we use the Visual Studio IDE is they don't learn the programming language. They learn the IDE. And they just take a shot with IntelliSense and they never really learn what to do. You know, and, and they kind of over rely on it. So that's one reason why we use that. I don't want you to see the squiggly lines. I want you to struggle through with it, you know, and, and get in. That being said, there's some assistance that we can have. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sometimes when I'm in a notebook and I do make a mistake, I notice the date shows up. Repeat that. Sometimes if I make a mistake, the date shows up. And I don't know if it's because I'm in a notebook or because I have a mistake. <laughs> yeah. That's not something. It, it, I just, if I erase it, if I forget, I forget to close something, the date comes up, and then I'll go back and fix it. What, what version of the category are you running? I was going to say, are you running the. Uh, the uh, uh, the the Harry Houdini magical no, version of Notepad or yeah I well I that that's a new one on me um, thank your lucky stars. Yeah, just a yeah dumb text editor, right? All right. Anyhow, what are some of the tools that you can have to, to check to make sure that your code is correct? And one of them is a validator. All right. Associated with the organization that <coughs> creates these web standards is called the W3C. And their page is w3c.org. These are the folks that make the standards. These are the folks that define what the tags are, what HTML4 was, what HTML5 is, what CSS2 is. You want to make something uh, bold, this is the code that you put in. All right. They have associated with their page, they have a, val uh, a series of validators. All right. And let's look at the HTML validator. There's a validator both for HTML and for CSS. And you can validate this a couple different ways. You can put in the URL, you can upload a file, or what I typically do, I validate by direct input, where I just paste my code right in there. <clears throat> so let's take an example that we did maybe last week or a couple weeks ago. I can find one. Here, this is an old example. All right. Here's my page, real simple, straightforward. All right, there we go. All right, what I can do is I can copy this page, copy the text from it, paste it into the validator. And then click check. 
and it tells me that this was successfully validated as HTML5. All right, so you get a cookie. All right, you did a good job. All right. Now, well, we'll, we'll see that in a second here. Now, the thing to keep in mind, this doesn't mean that every browser is going to display your page correctly, unfortunately. That's the whole catch of browser incompatibility issues. But this is a good first step. All right. This makes sure that if there are problems with the way the page displays, it's not your fault. All right. Which I guess really doesn't count for anything, right? Because you still have to go and fix it, and you still have to go and make it work. But at least you know that it wasn't some careless mistake that you made. All right. It gave me a couple of warnings, and some of these warnings are less important. All right. One of these warnings is important. All right. That there's a comment before the doc type, and apparently that could potentially freak out Internet Explorer. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, we'll actually talk about Quirks Boat in a second because it's it actually is 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 interesting the way Quirks. All right, so I got rid of the one warning. So that was good to see. In general, look at the warnings. Some of the warnings just always pop up. For example, one of the warnings is that HTML5 validation is, is experimental. In other words, they're still debugging it and still working through it. All right, so that's one warning. That has absolutely nothing to do with me. That's just the state of their software. I don't specify what character encoding it is. In other words, I didn't specify uh, that I'm using the, the standard United States English alphabet. All right. And therefore, it's assuming that I am using a certain, the standard coding. So those, those warnings I can live with. What's quirks mode? All right. Back in the old days, a long time ago, this is story time, right? A long time ago, there was less compatibility between browsers than there are than there is today. All right. And again, IE did some things in a very non-standard way and did some things correctly. Or I'm sorry, incorrectly especially relating to the topic that we're going to talk about next, which is the box model for, for HTML and CSS. So we got some of those things wrong. Well, guess what? Web developers creating web pages couldn't go to their boss and say, hey, I developed this page correctly, i.e. got it wrong. Because the boss would say, well, I really don't care. 95% of the people at the time were using IE. Therefore, it doesn't matter theoretically that you coded the page correctly. In practice, you've got to make it work with the browsers that are out there. So people wrote code that didn't match up with the standard, which already should tell you you're heading down a bad path, right? But which went along with the incorrect implementation of IE standard. All right. So going forward, IE wants to correct those problems. All right. Guess what happened if they just corrected those problems? Everyone whose whose pages worked under the old incorrect implementation would now break. All right. So, yeah. So. Yeah, I guess you could go to your boss and say, see, I told you so. I did it right the first. But again, that really wouldn't count for anything. So there was a dilemma. All right, Because the browser was broke, people wrote code that was broke so they would work on a broken browser. You fix the browser. Now your broken code is going to create a broken web page. So what do you do? All right. Essentially, what we want to say is, from this point forward, all right, we're going to follow the rules as correctly as we can. But for old web pages, 
we're going to follow the broken rules. So those old broken pages look correct. All right. The point is, is how do you, how does the browser know from this page, from this point on to do it? All right. The way the browser does, knows this is via the doc type. All right. Which is why the validator got all cranky when my doc type wasn't the first thing on the page. Right. The doc type tells the browser when the page was written, in effect. All right. If there's no doc type, it assumes the page is an old, old, old page, and therefore was probably written with the broke rules in mind. Therefore, it reverts into what is affectionately called quirks mode. All right. So quirks mode is a current browser implementing a web page that's old, following the broken rules that were in effect in the past. All right. And doc type switching is done. Based on the doc type, it tells if it's a new page that should be, we should follow the rules by the book or use the old broken rules. Now what does this have to do with you? All right. If you're developing brand new web pages, you want to follow the rules and always put your doc type in it. Because if you don't put a doc type in the page, the browser is going to um, assume quirks mode and, and not validate it correctly. Or I'm sorry, not display it correctly according to the rules. All right. So that's quirk mode, quirks mode in a nutshell. Now, the question is, is what if we do make a mistake? All right. Let's say I forget the end title tag. All right. We don't get warnings, we get errors. All right. Now the thing to keep in mind about these errors is this is a computer program that's checking your code. It's not a person that like has judgment and can get to the root of the problem. It just knows mechanically what is wrong. So the errors it can give you can be kind of puzzling. And it might actually give you errors that um, the verbiage doesn't quite make sense. For example, the first error it tells me is that it reached the end of the document, reached the end of the file, and it was expecting an end tag. Now notice it doesn't tell me what it was expecting an end tag for. We're going to be able to conclude that in a second here. All right. All it tells me is, hey, I'm missing some end tag. And it knows that I'm missing an end tag because, well, there's an end tag missing, and it got to the end of the line and didn't find that end tag. All right, so it knows that there's a problem. Here, the next error tells me, hey, we have a title tag that doesn't have an end tag. So we can sort of put two and two together and say, hey, I forgot to end my title tag because that will really fix both errors. One thing when you first start running your code through this validator is it can be a humbling and, and a, a, a frightening thing because one mistake or two mistakes can show up as a bunch of different errors. So if you run through this and you see that there are 12 errors, there aren't necessarily 12 things wrong. There could just be two or three things wrong that sort of trigger a domino effect and the fact that it can't find the ending tag here means that it thinks that this starting tag's in the wrong place and so on. Because again, it's a very mechanical process for the computer to go through. And as you can see, that's the errors that we get if we omitted the end title tag. If we put the end title tag in, it'll correct both of those errors. All right. 
Even if I misspell it, let's say I'm title and I forget the E. One thing wrong, right? One letter wrong. How many errors do you think we're going to get? I'm guessing we're going to get three errors. Two errors, all right. Interesting, we got the same errors as before. It knows that I hit the end of the document and I don't have an end title tag, and it knows that this end title doesn't have an end title. If things are nested incorrectly, we'll get an error. So for example, if I put You know, if I nest it incorrectly, I'll get errors. In this case, I get three errors. <laughs> and again, funny thing about this is, doesn't really tell you anything. Right. That, that's pretty obscure even for, for this. But at the very least it points you in the right direction. That it's somewhere around the style tag that there's a problem. Let me put the header not in the body. Let's see if that gives us an error. And sure enough, it does. And it'll tell us something like you can't have that tag there. All right. A body star tag was seen, but an element of the same type was already open. Again, that's a very obscure way of telling you that that belongs in the body. All right. Because I have something that should be in the body prior to the body. At some point we'll have an assignment where you're going to have to run your code through the validator. When you do so, yesterday being Douglas Adams's birthday, it's a good thing to remember when you see a bunch of errors, don't panic. All right? Because you will see a lot of errors, but that doesn't mean that you've made a lot of mistakes. All right, it could be a couple mistakes. Now these might be hard to decipher. So in lab, if you run into these, please don't hesitate to ask if it seems tough to decipher. It takes a while of practicing to sort of like learn, oh, it says this, well, it probably means something like that. All right. Um, so by all means, again, um, you know, if you have questions or if you have problems um, with this, let me know. Or again, email it to me and tell me uh, that, that you're getting errors that you don't understand. All right. One thing that happens too sometimes is if, if there's something that you forget, uh, for example, putting an alt attribute on your image. All right. If you forget to do that and you have five or six images, it will tell you five or six times that you have a missing alt attribute. So again, you can have a couple little things wrong that shows up as a bunch of things. All right. Now, let me think what else. Oh, there's also validation for CSS code. I'm going to take the CSS code and validate it. Let's say, for example, Here's a common mistake people make. Background. They forget the G. And they'll look at this and say, hey, it's not the color it's supposed to be. Well, again, you know, sometimes staring at it isn't the right answer. Right? Because if you miss it the first time, there's a good chance you're going to stare at it and think of it over and over and over again. Alright? This is where having some 
tools to systematically troubleshoot is good. All right? Far too many developers, whether you're talking about software developers or web developers, just use the approach of, you know, if I haven't found it by staring at it for 10 hours, then staring at it for the 11th hour is bound to give me the right answer. All right? That's not the case, right? If you're staring at it over and over again, obviously that approach isn't working. All right? It's good to have sort of a systematic way of debugging. In other words, a process that you go through. And with regards to HTML and CSS, one of the things that you can do systematically is run it through the validator. Think of the validator as a, a second set of eyes, right? And it's the second set of eyes that don't get tired, that don't miss things, that weren't absent a day in class when something was covered so they're not sure and they're very good spellers these second sets of eyes so I can take this CSS code and run it through the validator and it will tell me at least in its own way what's wrong the, the one thing with these second set of eyes though that they're not good at is they don't communicate well <laughs> all right Therefore, they're not going to necessarily give you the exact right answer. So if I type in background of yellow instead of background, it'll tell me, hey, there's an error. And it tells me the property background doesn't exist. What that means is there's no such thing as background. And if you correct the spelling to background, then it will validate correctly. No. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything you can do, anything you can do to do it incrementally is better than waiting until you're all done. So, you know, validate it periodically, uh, test it across browsers periodically. That's probably a better way to do it than waiting until you're, you're all done and trying to do it. Because then it comes into uh, a needle in a haystack kind of thing, you know. Um, you know, look at it this way. If you have a chunk of code and you validated it, then you added 10 lines of code and all of a sudden it doesn't work now, well, you can be pretty well assured that it's one of those 10 lines of code that messed it up. Whereas if you have a whole web page, it's 100 lines of code, and you haven't validated it at all until you're done, then you have no idea where that error is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, two different validators because they're validating two different rules, sets of rules. Right. Right. Well, I think you can comment in CSS, but I think it's a different syntax. Okay. All right. CS, the syntax for CSS comments is like this. Looks more like, like C -sharp. Uh, yeah, C Sharp or Java or JavaScript. Now, what you could do is you could put an HTML comment before and after the style tag or before and after the link, and I think that would work too. But within the CSS code, you need to use that syntax for commenting it out. Other questions? I want to show you a web page that I show all my classes, and this is meant to be inspirational. All right. This is a good inspiration as we get into talking about the CSS box model and what we can do with style sheets. And that is 
the site that I want to show you is the CSS Zen Garden site. And let me explain to you the premise of this site. This site is a site that is meant to show you how powerful CSS is and all the good things that can happen when you separate your HTML from CSS and have the HTML be strictly the content and have the CSS be everything about the appearance, which is our goal, right? Which is why you might have grumbled, some of you, that said, when I said, don't use a center tag, don't use a break tag, don't use a font tag, don't use this tag or that tag, don't use the, the align attribute on an HTML tag. The reason that I mention that is we want to remove any aspect of the appearance from our HTML so that we have tremendous flexibility in styling it. The idea of this web page is this, all right? We, this web page con, or this website consists entirely of one HTML document that is styled a whole bunch of different ways. Every page that we go to on this site is the same HTML document but it's styled with a different CSS file. So this is a default look. This is the basic look. All right? And let's, let's notice a few sort of landmarks so that we can go and we can see where they are on other pages. We have the words, the road to enlightenment. We have Zen Garden. We have a paragraph that starts, a demonstration of what can be accomplished. So what is this all about? Select the design and so on. So we have all those different touch points and let's as we go from page to page notice that it's the same HTML. If we were to look at the HTML and go and do a view source, right mouse, view source, we will see the only thing that will be different will be the style sheet that's here. That's the only thing that's going to be different from page to page. All right, let's look at some of these examples. All right, that page is the same page as this page, same HTML code. A demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment, so what is this all about? Select the design. This is the same page. This is the same page. This is the same page. Here's my contribution, which doesn't look near as good as any of these other ones. They have so many designs that are sort of their official designs, and mine didn't make the cut as far as their official design. But keep in mind, the folks that are doing this are like the best graphic designers in the world, or, or the experts in all this. And I, I hold this up to you, you know, not with the expectation that you'll be able to do these things, because again, the, you know, the, these are the Michael Jordans of the, the CSS world, all right? But it should serve as inspiration, it should reinforce in you the idea of we can accomplish this if we keep our HTML code only containing the content and do nothing that remotely relates to appearance in it and handle everything about the appearance in the CSS. Actually, this issue is even more important when you start factoring in the fact that people are using mobile devices now. Because mobile devices then is another platform that people can use. All right, to access the website. One thing that we do, and uh, again, we have a class in mobile web design, is you can actually write CSS that applies, have one CSS that applies if you're on a desktop, one that applies on a mobile device. Question. I'm seeing a booth there. Yes. Question. 
question. Would the JPEG for the boot be part of the HTML? It's a background for one of the things. In other words, you can put, through your CSS, you can put a background image on any element. So probably the header for this page has a background. We can even see these CSS files if, if you're interested. We can do a view source. Again, the only thing that's different is the CSS file. And we can actually look at the CSS for this. All right, and there we have, yeah, that's probably the, um, that's probably the boot, if not one of these other things, maybe that one's the boot. Yes? So the original page that you showed us probably didn't have any JPEGs on it? They were all images attached to something? Probably. Yeah, probably. We actually could, let's see, we could see what the plain HTML looks like. So in this case, if you're going to submit something, you just take whatever their basic HTML is, mm -hmm. and all you're doing is design style sheets. Exactly. So all right, here is the basic CSS file. Um, let me rephrase that. Here is the basic HTML file. Absolutely. 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 D designing a web, when you're designing, let, let, let me qualify my answer. The question is when you're developing a website, you should focus on the content. You should focus on the content as far as the HTML goes. The HTML ought to be entirely like the content and the way the content is logically structured. That's part of the content. Now, images can be part of the content, right? If you have, for example, a news story that said that, you know, um, Dr. Church gave a speech here on campus, all right? And there's a picture of Dr. Church. You know, consider that to be part of the content, right? But if we have something like a logo or something that's just decoration, then really that could be part of the CSS. So absolutely, the focus as far as the HTML goes is the content. Other questions? I thought I saw a hand up. Interesting thing is if you look at this, this is the kind of page that we could have done the first week of class. <laughs> All right? If we look at this, right mouse and do a view source, you'll see that what do we have? We have divs. Well, maybe second week of class. This is actually done with HTML4. Uh, 4.01, that's why you see divs instead of the header and article and all that. But the idea is basically the same. All right. This really, nothing terribly difficult uh, in the HTML here. And all of it's done via CSS. Because again, what's in the HTML? The content. All right. Anything about the appearance and the way it looks and the, and the physical layout is done via CSS. Now then, if I wanted to make a mobile version of this, piece of cake, right? I could, if I, and I'm going over time, I know, consider it value for your dollar. If I go and I pull this up on my mobile device, Mm -hmm. And then if I go and click on the HTML, this is a serviceable website even on a mobile device. I could put a couple tweaks in there to make it look a lot better that without much effort at all. 
Why? Because again, there was such a clean separation between the presentation and content. All right. Questions? Next time we'll have a couple other loose ends that uh, I want to fill up and then we'll get into the box model which is going to deal with how we can start doing some of these more advanced things as far as layout goes. All right, we'll see you over in lab.